I'm Lisa Panisi, like they said, and I work in, um, or I work on environmental behavior change, encouraging that, and in environmental education. So, um, a lot of times we have to do these things because our dean tells us we need to work on behavior change, or maybe we have a grant, and the grant says we need to work on behavior change. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to um, say a little bit um, contrary to what Crystal talked about, but I'll try to explain that. But a lot of times we think that people just need to know the facts, right? If they just know the facts, they'll change their behavior. If we just know that smoking is bad for us, we'll stop smoking, right? If we know that sugar is bad for us or bacon makes us have heart attacks, we'll stop eating bacon. Well, that's just not going to happen, right? So how do we get people to do these things? Um, it's not issues and consequences. It's not necessarily the facts that get them to change their behavior. And it's not even money. A lot of times we think it's the money. Well, smoking is expensive. Um, organic food is expensive. And that doesn't usually change behavior. And then scientists for a long time thought that attitudes change behavior. But they really don't correlate very well. So these are all myths. Um, some examples would be if we make these posters and we do these things and we show people all these facts and we have the word money on there, they'll change their behavior. But it really doesn't happen and that's actually just a lot to read. And research shows people don't read a lot. So then we say, well, maybe we give it to them in numbers. If we show them simple one, two, three, four, five things they can do, they'll change their behavior. And we put a big dollar sign on there. But that doesn't work again. So then we say, well, what if we don't make them read, really, and we just give them this big crap? Well, the crap kind of doesn't make sense, even with the big dollar sign on there. Uh, it's not going to necessarily make us stop using our refrigerator to save energy. So then what if we make it even simpler? We, everybody likes pie. We make a pie grant or a graph. And um, it still doesn't really help people relate to what's going on. Um, I'm going to quiz you. So knowledge, does knowledge correlate with behavior, do you think? Oh, I tricked you already. So it's actually true. Um, <laughs> it does correlate with behavior. So um, if we have a lot of knowledge, we are likely to do these things. It's just not where we start with people. So does education increase knowledge? Yes, please say yes. <laughs> Increasing knowledge lead to behavior change. Yeah. That's the no. Okay. <laughs> if we start with knowledge, a lot of times that doesn't increase behavior change. In fact, we can do the opposite. If we have people with values, like Crystal was talking about, that are the opposite, and we give them all these arguments, they can use those arguments to strengthen their um, opinion that they already hold. Knowledge isn't really this great motivator of behavior. It is important, though, it can be a barrier to behavior. If I don't know how to caulk my windows and seal leaks in my house to save energy, then I'm not going to be able to do that. And that's procedural knowledge, and that can be important if we find that it is. Um, for example, if we want to tell people to save energy and they don't know to use a fan to circulate air or makes it cooler at the same temperature, or they don't know to close their blinds, um, these things can make a difference. Another thing that we do is we tell people how bad things are. Um, we tell people if only 35% th only of the people um, recycle their plastic water bottles, or only that many are recycled. And then we tell them, well, this is really an important issue. Be concerned. And we think then people will say, oh, OK, I'll recycle all my bottles. But it doesn't really work that way. Same with riding the bus. There could be barriers to riding the bus. It's easier to get in your own car. Maybe the bus has a negative stereotype. I've heard called the shame train. Um, so maybe it's things like that. So um, what do we do? Um, we, you know, if we give these people these severity statistics, it can have a boomerang effect. It can say to people, well, if only 34% of people recycle, that means 70-some percent of people don't, and I have to be where everyone else is, so I don't have to recycle. And then we have this boomerang effect, and we want to avoid that. Um, just think of when we 
hear that commercial come on about animals in the Humane Society, we hear Sarah McLaughlin's song. We just go, <laughs> change the <laughs> And so a lot of times these statistics work against us. So in this case, these people tried to get people to recycle their oil. They said only 10% of people recycle their oil, meaning 90% of people don't. So I want to be, you know, in that majority. And then they told people how to dump their oil legally. They yeah, said, right. dump the sewers, in empty lots, in holes in the ground, on the weeds. So we want to be careful. We, we, that motivates us if we're concerned. But we have to think about it in terms of our audience. So another example would be one in four eighth graders have been drunk. And then they go on to say um, three in three of every ninth, or one in three ninth graders, 30%, 50% of 10th graders have been drunk. What does that say to you if you're in eighth or ninth grade and you haven't been drunk? Yeah, I see that. Yeah, so you're drunk, right? <laughs> We have to think about what they're thinking about. We have to do the formative research to see where our audience is, what resonates with them, what they need, what their barriers are, and what motivates them. So, what are some do's? I give you a bunch of don'ts. What are some do's? Um, well, we can identify people personally. Smokey the Bear was one of the most effective campaigns ever because he said, only you. He drew people in and called them out. So we can appeal to their identity like Smokey. We can be a likable source, celebrities, for example. We use a lot of celebrities to make appeals. Um, reciprocity, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. Um, scarcity. Infomercials, Ken pointed this out before. Um, call in the next 10 minutes or you won't get this deal, right? Um, be careful of incentives as well. If we give people things, um, it doesn't always work. It can create a norm. It can get your brand out. But people can say, well, I'm only wearing this Nike jacket. It's not Nike. Uh, but I'm only wearing this Nike jacket. I don't really like your shoes because it was free or something. Um, Prompts, like the little stickers we have all over UNL to tell us to turn the lights off, those work. Modeling is really effective. Um, if people model a behavior, if you see someone, if I take a snake to a classroom and I show the kids me touching it, other kids start to touch it, the other kids will say, okay, it's safe to do that. Um, giving people feedback. And then one of my favorites is an involving narrative. If I can make a very vivid picture and involve people in the story, think soap operas, think Harry Potter, um, that will really get people to think about things. So an example is that in a dorm room, um, they decided to try to save energy. So they used this video panel to monitor and get feedback of the energy use in the dorm. And it was two polar bears, a mom and her cub, on these icebergs. And as they used lots of energy, the icebergs began to melt. And if they melted a lot, the more they used, the polar bears would drown. So the kids were really motivated, and they saved over 30% in their energy with this. Hopefully they don't want to see the polar bear drown. Right. Yeah. We can do, and this is one of my favorites, is get that emotional tie to nature. So we need to have things be experiential, be hands-on. We need to get kids out there. We need to get kids doing science, like uh, Jenny was talking about, and get them actually experiencing these things. So commitment again. If we spread this norm, if we spread our message, if everybody's wearing our ends, um, that spreads our message. And so these messages, these norms that are often very effective, they're very culturally based. They're, societal, they're something in our society like saying, God bless you when someone sneezes. They're the convention. They're what everyone does. Um, you don't want to go to a, into a business meeting, right? Everyone's in suits and you're in shorts and flip-flops. Um, if you don't believe me, ride the elevator the next time and turn the other way. 
movement okay. away from the door. Okay, it's, those are very powerful motivators to have these conventions in how we do behavior. And they're very influential because people want to be like other people. Okay, so we use these a lot in advertising. Sometimes we'll, we used to use them not quite so well. So if you're old enough, you remember Iron Eyes, Iron Eyes Cody, a Native American who cried over all the litter. But it was actually a bad norm because we showed all this litter, as if the litter was normal and the pollution was normal. Um, so in this one, the same thing. We're showing all this trash. Really, we want to show clean streets. Okay. So how do we use these norms to create these hands? What are some simple techniques? Um, the tip jar is a great example. If the tip jar, everybody knows who's ever had to work for tips, if the tip jar is baited, people are more likely to give you tips. We can say things like, join thousands of others to make it seem like everyone is doing this. We can say, most people do this behavior to make it really seem like everyone's doing it, right? Isn't that powerful when you were a kid, your mom said, you can't do that, and you'd say, mom, everyone's doing it, right? <laughs> so what are some other techniques? Found, my students found, even on campus, efficacy matters. When we looked at campus recycling behavior, behavior and voting behavior that's coming up, if you think your behavior makes a difference, you're more likely to do it. If you think your behavior does not make a difference, then you think, why bother? So we have to make people think they can make a difference. An example would be aluminum dumped into our landfills today will remain there for 200 years not very motivating. It doesn't make you feel like you can do anything about the situation. But if you say, for each can, you can run a 100 watt light bulb for four hours, that's much more motivating. It's much more tangible. Okay? And these are some more examples. Um, you could say that this paper saves 284 acres of forest, or cars, but you can make these things very tangible for people. So just to summarize, there's some really easy things that you can do. You need to do the formative research, but without time, an easy, quick way to change people's behavior is to start with the behavior. So give them role models, make emotional ties, make it cultural. If everyone on the street recycles, then you're not going to want to stand out as a person who doesn't. Get those norms out there. Say most people do this. All Huskers are interested in recycling. Um, empower people and give them their identity. Draw them in. Make it relevant to them. Okay. So some examples of what we're doing. Um, we're working on campus recycling and composting. And uh, Sarah uh, has some of my students where they're working on backpacks for adventure. I'm going to hit Dean Hibbert up for money um, soon. And so <laughs> they're, they're working with the community learning centers in town with the Title I kids, the kids who are the highest need, kids who um, may not speak English. And we're going to try to get them some science activities and backpacks they can check out with their families and go outside and do some of these things in their own communities because place-based experiences matter very much as well. So those are some of the things that we're doing. Any questions? diffusion of innovation, we know that we have to start with those early adopters. And so some people don't care so much about booking the norms. Um, so those are great people to target. Some people just like to do things early, we've learned. You know, some people want the latest technology as fast as possible. Um, but another thing we do is we just tell people everyone is. And eventually... <laughs> <laughs> That's our resident. It's putting money in the tip jar. Yeah, in the tip jar, right. Yes. So it seems to me climate change is one of the hardest things to apply those to because change is in the future and it's global. How do you engage people 
within the framework you outlined? Yeah, climate change is a hard one. Um, it's hard for lots of reasons. There's a lot of science. There's a lot of denying. There's a lot of controversy, right? So if people are entrenched, Crystal and I were talking, if they're entrenched in their view to begin with and you give them all these facts, a lot of times they just back up the opinion that they've already had. So that's again a case though where norms could be great. If all your neighbors are recycling if all, and we focus on the behavior rather than the controversy um, and all your neighbors are recycling, your neighbors are saving energy, your neighbors are doing these things, those focuses will help take away from the controversy and then eventually they have to have their attitudes line up with their behavior. Humans don't like to have cognitive dissonance. We don't like to do things and not be able to explain ourselves. So that helps a lot, starting with behavior in that way, too. There was another hand up, I think. Yes? I had a question about assessment. So how do you assess the success of some of these initiatives? Yeah, behavior change is tough to assess, right? Um, so we can ask people. We can ask them for self-reports. We can ask them, well, a lot of research, I'll back up, ask them for their intentions. But intentions don't always line up with their behavior. We can ask them for self-reports, but we have to be careful that they don't just report that they're doing something because that's social desirable behavior, socially desirable. Um, so it's best to watch people, but that's really, really hard to do. In recycling, there have been studies where people you know, weigh their garbage and look at it, things like that, but it is more expensive and more time consuming to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.